Welcome to Chem with Chem. This is the full work through of the January 2022 edition of the CXC CSEC Chemistry Paper 2. Remember to like, share, and subscribe so you don't miss out when other work throughs are posted. You may select or toggle to your question of choice by using the timestamp shown on screen. Let's dive in. It is recommended that we do not spend more than 30 minutes on question one. A student conducted an experiment to investigate the reaction between calcium carbonate and dilute nitric acid. He weighed 1.8 grams of powdered calcium carbonate, very important word right here, powdered, and allowed it to react with excess dilute nitric acid. Excess dilute nitric acid means that all the calcium carbonate present would have been used up. The volume of gas produced at 10 second intervals was measured for a total of 80 seconds. Table one is a record of the volume of gas produced from the reaction, that's with the powdered calcium carbonate. Figure one is an incomplete diagram of the arrangement of the apparatus used in the experiment. And we're going to be coming back to table one in a little while. So we are asked now to complete, complete figure one, complete figure one by drawing and labeling the remaining apparatus to show how the gas was collected and measured. All right, so we're going to be drawing what's missing from this um, apparatus that's here. And this is going to show how the gas was collected and measured. Very important word here, collected and measured. So what's missing? Let's um, get right into it. This is for the tissue funnel. Doesn't play a big role in measuring, but it plays a big role in releasing the amount of acid needed, even though we're seeing where everything is already in the container or the conical flask. This is our delivery tube, which would take us to our gas syringe. And we should use a pencil and ruler to do this, but given the medium I'm using, all right, so this would have to be sealed, can't seal after we've added. The whole system would have to be sealed. The calcium carbonate powder would have had to be in the flask and then the acid is added from here, from the tissue funnel. So this is the setup, so we're just going to label. So this is our thistle funnel and this differentiate Right there, so that's our rubber bone. And this over on our right is our gas syringe. And we don't need to say it's graduated. That would probably be over answering. So this is our gas, that's our gas syringe. And that should give us the three marks there. So that's what's missing from the diagram. Okay, so we're at part B. Using the axes in figure two, plot a graph on page five showing the volume of gas produced versus time for the reaction of dilute nitric acid with the powdered calcium carbonate. Label this graph A. What's very important before we even begin to plot is to ensure that we know the scale on each axis. So looking at the X axis, we see that each centimeter is used to represent five units. So that's five seconds, right? So we're going up five, 10, 15, 20, and so on. So it means each millimeter then, each of the, each of the smallest square that is present is representing one second. Now on the y-axis, we're seeing where one centimeter is being used to represent 25 units, that's 25 centimeters cube. So it means that each of those tiny or each of those one millimeter square 
is representing five centimeters cubed. So let us um, plot. So the first point is plotted for us. So we're going to go right ahead into the second one. So at 10 seconds, we have 100 cm cube being produced of gas being produced. So we'll find 10 on our x axis and we're going to go up. This is where 100 is. Right, so that's the first one. Um, at 20, we have 190. So 20 is here. We're going to find 190. 90 is here. 30, 250. That one is an easier one. 40, 280. 50, 320. 60, 340. 60 is 340. So here we go. This is the right here. 70, 360. And uh, at 80, 360. So we see that things have leveled off. So after 70, no more gas was produced. We're getting a leveling off. We say that the reaction would have stopped at 70 seconds. All right, so we're not finished. We, we would have um, plotted. We now need to connect these points that we've plotted and we're going to do this using, it's going to be a curve, I'm not going to use um, a straight line. So we're going to um, do it free-handedly and we should get a nice curve. So let's just get that going. All right, there we are. So that is what we want, and we should label this one. We said we should label this graph A. So we'll call this graph A. Okay, part C, write a balanced equation, including state symbols for the reaction between calcium carbonate and the dial nitric acid. Okay, we get a mark for having the correct state symbols, and that's very important. So, this is what we have, calcium carbonate, CaCO3, solid plus HNO3 equals, it's an acid. All nitrates are soluble, Ca bracket NO3 bracket 2 equals plus CO2 gas plus H2O, which is a liquid, all right? So let's balance, we have two nitrate here. So we need two in front of the nitric acid and everything is now balanced and that would give us three marks. Now depart B, calculate the volume of gas that can be obtained from reacting 1.8 grams of calcium carbonate with dilute nitric acid at RTP. And we're told one mole of gas occupies 24,000 cm cube at RTP. That's the molar volume at RTP. And we're given the RAM for, you know, carbon, oxygen, calcium. So we're just going to work with that. So looking at this equation, the equation is going to guide us here. We don't see a number in front of calcium carbonate. So we know one is there telling us that one mole one mole of calcium carbonate reacts with two moles of nitric acid to give us one mole of calcium nitrate and one mole of carbon dioxide. We're going to ignore the water for now. One mole of water is produced. So we're concerned about calcium carbonate and volume of gas. So we know that for every one mole of calcium carbonate, we end up with one mole of carbon dioxide, which has a volume of 24 cm cube at RTP. So for the first mark, well, we could write a statement that says one mole of calcium carbonate produces one mole of carbon dioxide. Better yet, one mole of calcium carbonate has a molar mass of, but we need to find that first. We're given the RAM, so we're just going to use that to find the molar mass of 
calcium carbonate. Of course, we're going to express that in um, grams per mole. So we have one calcium, so that's 40 plus 12 from carbon, and we have three oxygen, 316, 48. I like this one because it gives 100. So 100 grams is the molar mass. 100 grams per mole is the molar mass for calcium carbonate. So we can now say that 100 grams of calcium carbonate reacts to give us the one mole of carbon dioxide, but we know that one mole of a gas occupies 24,000 cm cube at RTP. So this is the volume of gas that's produced from the 100 grams of calcium carbonate. Now, if we use 1.8 grams of calcium carbonate instead of the 100, we need to find out what volume of gas carbon dioxide will be produced. So we're now going to cross multiply. Of course, when we do that, we're going to have 100 grams times x is equal, we're going across diagonals, 1.8 grams times 24,000 cm cube. We're going to divide both sides by 100 grams to make x the subject. And when we do that, we're going to end up with x being equal to 430. Two cm cube of CO2. And that would give us our three marks. From the graph, the total volume of gas produced is 360 centimeters cube. Calculate the difference in volume between the answer obtained in D and the total volume produced. Suggest a possible reason for the difference. Now, so here it's simple math again, we're going to show. All right, so from the calculation just now, we expected 432 centimeters cube of gas to be formed. So theoretically, we, theoretically we expected 432 cm cube, but in reality, according to the question, 360 cm cube, cube of carbon dioxide uh, was actually produced. So they want us to calculate the difference, so we're just going to state that 432 cm cube minus 360 cm cube, and the difference there is 72 cm cube. And so we should suggest a possible reason for the difference. Now, a possible reason for the difference why we, we did not have all of 432 being produced, it could be um, impurities. Impurities could, be, could have been present in the calcium carbonate sample. Right, and if impurity is present, it means that we we don't have one hundred um, percent purity of the calcium carbonate, so we would not get the expected volume of gas or the expected amounts of products um, formed. Now, state three factors, three factors that can affect the rate of reaction between dilute nitric acid and calcium carbonate. Not not factors that affect rate of reactions in general, but the factors that, that could affect or can affect the reaction between the rate of reaction between dilute nitric acid and calcium carbonate. So of course, temperature is one. Pressure does not apply here. So temperature is one. Surface area is another. And we could have concentration. Of course, the concentration of the nitric acid in this case. And that would give us three marks, just like that. G, if marble chips, that's large granules of calcium carbonate were used instead of powdered calcium carbonate, sketch a graph of what this reaction would be on figure two on page five. Label this sketch graph B. So if we had used um, large granule instead of powder, we would have less surface area exposed, so we'd expect a slower rate of reaction. So to show a slower rate of reaction, we just need to show a curve or a graph that is not as steep 
So let's see, let's look at what our sketch would be like. So let's go right ahead and just sketch what the graph would look like if we had used granulated calcium carbonate or marble chips with smaller surface area. So this is what our sketch would look like. All right, so we're seeing, let's look at the similarities well, in anticipation of question H. So let's just look at the similarities. The final volume of gas produced is the same. What's different though is the time taken. You see that um, for graph A, we really should label graph B. That's uh, granulated. Granulated C is CO3, and this one is powdered. All right. So we're seeing that we're seeing that the final volume it produced is still 360 centimeters cubed, but we're seeing that um, this volume was produced. We're seeing that the powdered calcium carbonate produced this volume faster than um, the granulated calcium carbonate, and also. Um, there's a steeper, there's a steeper slope for um, graph A, and this tells us that the rate of reaction was faster. So we can think of um, this as a slide. Whichever one would get you sliding down faster is the one with the faster rate. So we're seeing that the initial rate here for A is higher than that of um, B. It is steeper, so that's not um, a difference. Okay, so here we're asked to complete the table below by identifying one similarity. So we just went through the similarity and the difference between graph A and graph B, and we're asked to suggest one reason for each. So we're just going to, to write them in. We just um, discuss them. So the similarity is that both of them tapered off at the same value. So both tapered off at the same value, meaning both produce the same volume of gas. So, so both graphs tapered off at the same volume, or they show that you know, 360 cm cube of CO2 was produced. And the reason there would be that you know, the same mass was used, so the same volume would be produced. So even though one was granite, one was granulated and one was powdered, the same mass was used. So the same mass of calcium carbonate was used in each reaction. So it follows we would get the same volume being produced. The difference, um, there are two. The difference is for graph. A, we see where the volume of gas produced happened faster for graph A versus graph B. Or we could state that the, the initial rate of graph A is faster or the slope, the slope, slope of graph A is steeper than that of graph B. And this is showing us that the rate of reaction for powdered CaCO3, which was used in A, was, that's WAS, was faster due to larger surface area resulting in more collisions. So anything that results in more collision, anything that increases the frequency of collision will result in a faster rate. So that's it, 25 marks. Number two, part A. Kwesi went to the kitchen to collect his morning snack during his study break and saw some strips of green papa in a container of water. He did not think anything of it, but when he returned to the kitchen later, he observed that all the strips were swollen. Ah, this must be osmosis, he thought. 
define the term osmosis. All right, so whenever we get definitions, we just gobble them up. All right, so very important key terms that we don't want to, to miss. So osmosis is the movement. Let's see how the handwriting is holding up this time around. So osmosis is the movement of water molecules from an area where there is a lot to an area where are fewer and then the other key parts through a selectively keyword here selectively permeable not partially permeable but selectively because it will allow some particles to pass through and some to not pass through so through a selectively permeable membrane until evenly distributed so osmosis is a special type of diffusion except that in osmosis water molecules move and then there has to be movement of the water molecules through the selectively permeable membrane so that is key and of course all of this occurs because there needs to be well all of this occurs until there is an even or until there is until there is even distribution so first two marks off to a nice start explain how osmosis in the papa supports the particulate theory of matter. All right, so Quasi saw that strips of green papaya appear to be swollen, for want of a better word. All right, so for the strips to have become swollen, they had to have absorbed water. This movement and distribution of water is evidence that matter is made up of tiny particles. All right, you might not express it like that. You could express it in fewer words. You know, but you use your your own language to to, to ex, um, explain it. But you just want to state how this supports, how it provides evidence to support the particulate theory of matter. So please note that we would have to make mention of the particulate theory of matter. Here it goes. So. For the papa strips to have become swollen, water had to traverse the selectively permeable membrane of the papa strips. This movement of water proves or supports that matter is made up of tiny particles which are always in constant motion. Now your, your wording doesn't have to be like this, but as long as you, you, you show the link between the movement of water resulting in the swelling, quote unquote swelling of the papa strips, and you link that to, as long as you make that link and you show that that is supporting the particulate theory of matter, you're good. And you, you have to cite what the particulate theory of matter is in this to get the, the two marks. All right, so that's that. So part, part three, the green papa was a solid that was placed into a liquid. State how the arrangement of particles in a liquid differs from that in a solid and a gas, all right? basic things we're not going to take it for granted so in a liquid the particles are randomly arranged with small spaces between them in a solid the particles are arranged in a regular manner with no spaces between them while in a gas the particles are randomly arranged with large spaces between them and that would give you your full marks three marks there four diffusion is another process that supports the particulate theory of matter state one example of such a process and one is there in all caps just one so feel free to share your example in the comments below this video we'd love to um hear your thoughts so i am going to go with one that i'm very familiar with and this is smelling kfc from across the road there are countless others please share yours in the comments so part b of number two the element chlorine has an atomic number of 17 and it has two main isotopes with mass numbers 35 and 37 mm -hmm. respectively. Define the terms atomic number and mass number. Come on, give thanks for small mercies. Let's just get right to it. Atomic number refers to the number of protons in an atom and mass number refers to the sum of the protons and neutrons in an Part two of B, show by calculation that chlorine 35 and chlorine 37 are isotopes. So this is another way of testing to see if you know what isotopes are. So 
what we would do. We know that um, mass number is 35 for chlorine 35. So we're going to have just basic mass. 35 minus 17 protons. Let's put some English in it. And our answer would be 18 neutrons. It's a neutron number that is different. All right. There are isotopes, so they have the same, the same atomic number. So here for chlorine 37, it would be 37 minus 17 protons. And that would give us 20 neutrons. And again, just like that, two marks. Part three of B. A student, while investigating the reactions of chlorine, bubbles chlorine gas into an aqueous solution of potassium iodide and deduces that the potassium iodide was oxidized because a color change occurred. Write a balanced chemical ionic equation with state symbols for the reaction that is responsible for the color change. Three marks. So um, before we can, well, we could just write the, um, the balance and equation straight up. I want us to have an idea of where it's coming from. So we're going to start off with the, with the balance molecular equation first. All right. And we're using a technique to get to the ionic equation. We call it the, we call it the, we call it the Bible technique. Yes. A chapter a day. All right. So first things first, we're going to balance. So the first B is to balance the molecular equation. So we're going to start off chlorine, Cl2. All right. And we'll write as a gas. It's a gas that was bubbled, even though when it interacts with the water, it's going to become Cl2 aqueous. But we can um, write gas for it, um, potassium iodide, that's Ki, and that's aqueous. And of course, chlorine is going to be displacing the iodide. So here we go, KCl, potassium chloride, aqueous, Aq, to say it's in the presence of water. And the iodine that's produced is also in the presence of water. So we put aqueous. And of course, note that the halogens, we write them as diatomic elements, Cl2, I2. So anything that ends in INE and the gen, um, they are diatomic. All right, so that's the first part of Bible balance. The next thing, well, it's not balanced. So let's see, we have um, two chlorine on the left, one on the right. So we need to put a two. We need to put a two in front of KCl and that changes the K, the potassium to two. So we put a two right here. So everybody is now balanced. So that's the first B in Bible. The next thing we do is um, ionize. So the I is for ionize. So we're going to break down into ions, anything that is that is an ionic compound in aqueous medium or um, you know, an acid in aqueous medium. Anything, any element you know, in its standard form has to remain. Um, so we just get right into it. So it means that Cl2 would be written back as Cl2. Um, potassium iodide can be broken down into two moles of K plus A plus ions. We won't even say moles, we'll just say two. And we'll get two iodide ions, same state symbols. Okay, on the right, we'll have two K plus aqueous and two Cl minus aqueous. And we'll write back our iodine in aqueous medium. There are no ions present, so it would not ionize. All right, so we ionize. After we ionize, we have another B from, from Bible, which means we're going to balance. So we're going to balance the ions and all the other um, species that we have that we have um, present. So if your equation was balanced from the beginning, after you ionize it, it should be balanced. But we just want to check to ensure that we did not leave, leave off anything. So two chlorine on the left, and we have two chloride ions on the right. 2K plus ions on the left, 2K plus on the right. 2 I minus ions on the left, and we have I on the right. So that's good. So the next thing we do is L, which means we're going to leave out. So in leaving out or elimination, in leave, leaving out, we're going to cancel out all the ions that do, um, do not change in moving from the left to the right. So we have to look at their charges and we have to look at their state symbols. So we have 2K plus on the left, 2K plus on the, the right. So we're, we cancel those out. We call those the spectator ions. They're not really taking part in the reaction. It's just like a match. They're just cheering or watching. The real players here are chlorine and the iodine. And then what we do now, after we eliminate, we, we just write whatever we have left as the ionic equation. So it's really Cl2 gas plus 2I minus aqueous. That's Aq to give 2Cl minus plus I2 in aqueous medium. And then the final thing that we do 
from Bible is the E stands for equal. Ensure that we have the same charge on the left hand side. This is the left hand side over here, and this is the right hand side, RHS over there. So we have two minus, so the chlorine has no charge. We have two minus right here, and we have um, two minus on the right side. We have zero over there. So um, the charges are equal, so we're good to go. That does it. So this is our final answer. That's what they really wanted, but I just wanted us to, to be clear on where, on where this is coming from. So that which we've highlighted here, that's our answer. Cl2 gas plus 2i minus aqueous to give 2Cl minus aqueous plus I2 aqueous. All right, so chlorine here is, so chlorine here is oxidizing our iodide ions and the iodide ions being oxidized move from iodide to elemental iodine, which is in aqueous medium and that is what would be responsible for our color change. All right, tell me what, um, what you think the color change is. The color change was not, uh, mention was not made of the color change. What do you think the color change is? And please note when you're stating a color change, you need to state what the form of color was and what the final one um, is. So you have to say a color change from A to B, all right? Also, what I want you to include in the comments, what technique do you use to right an equation. I use the Bible technique. What do you use? I'd love to hear from you. Question 3a. Compound A is a straight chain hydrocarbon with the molecular formula C5H12. Now that's very important. C5H12 is um, an alkane. It's pentane to be exact. C5H12. So that means the general formula there would be CNH2N plus 2. So that's the alkane. That's from the alkane series. That's pentane. State one natural source and the two uses of compound A. So the natural source is petroleum, or you could say crude oil. Crude oil and petroleum are the same thing. Um, the other source is um, natural gas, but they ask for one. Um, two uses, it's used, pentane can be used as an organic solvent. It can also be used as, the, as a fuel. Could also be used as a refrigerant, but only two. Part two, draw the fully displayed structure of compound A. So we're drawing the fully displayed structure of pentane. Pent means five, and of course, in is the last name telling us it's from the alkene series. So there will be no carbon-carbon double bond. It's it's a saturated hydrocarbon. So we need five carbon atoms and we're going to adorn them beautifully with their hydrogens. Drawing this can be therapeutic. Part B, thermal and catalytic cracking are very useful processes in the petrochemical industry. Part one, define the term catalytic cracking. So this is the this is the breaking of long chain hydrocarbons into smaller ones using a catalyst. So catalytic cracking is the breaking of long chain hydrocarbons into smaller ones using a catalyst. And you know, very important here, um, they said useful, but um, we'll look more into that in a bit. State the, importance, state the importance of catalytic cracking in petroleum refineries. Now, Long chain hydrocarbons, you know, are not very useful. There are very few things you can do with them. So catalytic cracking results in the formation of smaller, um, smaller hydrocarbons or hydrocarbons with shorter chains, which are more useful. They can now be used as precursors for other reactions or even fuels. All right, so that's it. Part C. Ethene undergoes a halogenation reaction to form 1,2-dichloroethane. Draw the fully displayed structure of 1,2-dichloroethane, right? So this is ethane with a chlorine on each carbon. So I'll just put a chlorine on opposite sides. Doesn't matter where, as long as each is on, as long as there's a chlorine on each, each carbon. Right? And just so we can appreciate where that is coming from, it would have been the addition of a halogen to ethene. So ethene is this right here, that's its displayed formula, that's C2H4. 
So we would need to cut just using black carbon um, just to show that we're cutting um, one of the bonds there in the double bond. And then what we would do next, we would need to add chlorine to this. So severing the bond in the middle means that or means that each carbon atom now has a space for one more bond. So the chlorine could be added. We're not focusing on the mechanism. We're just looking at, in a sense, how it occurs, but not getting too much on the molecular level. All right, so that's where it's coming from. It would have been added to it. All right, so once we have what's in the box, we're good to go. Two marks. Part D, dichloromethane can be obtained from methane. This reaction takes place in two steps. Part one, right? Balance chemical equations to show each step in the formation of dichloromethane, right? So let's just get right into it. So methane, CH4, which is a gas, and we're going to need our chlorine, Cl2 gas. Now dichloro, di means two, okay, not necessary. Now this reaction is taking place in the presence of UV light. UV light will be used to split the chlorine to give us what we call chlorine radicals, but not, not getting into the um, scope of that right now. So what will happen here pretty much will have um, chlorine taking the place of one of the hydrogen. So instead of having CH4, we're going to have CH three, and where one of the hydrogen was, we'll have chlorine being there. So this is, this is now chloro, chloromethane, and the other product would be hydrogen chloride, HCl, which is also a gas. So the left, the one of the chlorine goes and takes the place of a hydrogen and the other chlorine now bonds with the hydrogen that's removed or that was substituted to give us hydrogen chloride. So in step two, this is like a chain reaction. It goes on and on. So the product, the chloromethane from, from the product here in step one is used as a starting material in step two. So we would start off with CH3Cl, which is a gas in the presence of more chlorine. So we would need chlorine again, gas in the presence of UV light. The UV light is used to split the chlorine into two. And then we're going to, we're going to have substitution occurring again. So we know, we'll now have CH2 and we've replaced one of the hydrogen with another chlorine. So it would now be Cl2. And this now is a liquid, the density is increasing. And again, we'll end up with hydrogen chloride, HCl gas. All right, the said dichloromethane. So two chlorines would be on the methane instead of the four. This could go on to give you a trichloromethane and a tetrachloromethane, but the total store show how dichloromethane is formed. So we stop right there. State whether the halogenation of part two, state whether the halogenation of methane is an addition or a substitution reaction. And we saw what, what was happening there. Chlorine took the place of hydrogen, just like in football. So, so this was a substitution reaction. And that would have given you one more mark and a total of 15 marks, so just like that. Part A, the position of an unknown element, Q, is shown in the periodic table in figure three, All right? So Q is in group two below magnesium. So that's the group that we call the alkali, alkaline earth metals. All right, state two factors that are used to arrange the elements in the periodic table. They're arranged based on increasing atomic number, so that's one factor. So two factors, there are three, but they want two. We have um, increasing atomic number, and we have, based on their chemical properties, we'll just state the third one, but we're only writing two. 
according to their electronic structure and that can be further broken down. Part two, based on the position of element Q in the periodic table, state whether it would react more vigorously or less vigorously with water than magnesium. And we're just going to use simple language and get straight to the point. It's below magnesium, so we know reactivity increases down the group for metals. So as a result, it would react more vigorously. State with the solution three. State with the solution formed from the reaction of Q with water would be acidic or basic. Give a range on the pH scale in which the solution would occur. So at the beginning, we said that group two elements are called alkaline earth metals. So um, from this reaction, when, when Q reacts with water, we would get um, the solution being alkaline. All right, so it would be basic. And I said alkaline a while ago, but alkaline basic um, can be used interchangeably. Um, and alkali is a base that's soluble in water. So they're almost saying the same thing, all right? Basic and the pH range would be um, between 10 to 12. Strong base, but they're not as strong as, um, they're not as strong as when the group one metals, the alkali metals actually um, react with water. And then four, based on the position of element Q, write the formula for its carbonate. If we know the formula of magnesium carbonate, we pretty much know the formula for all the carbonates of group two, right? So magnesium carbonate is MgCO3. So it's the same principle that we would use to write the formula for the carbonate of Q. So of course, we would have known that magnesium is in group two, so it's Mg2 plus carbonate is CO3, two minus. So of course, we need one, one magnesium ion to go with one carbonate, it's CO3, all right? You won't have to go into any LCM of two and two. You know, it's one to one, they cancel out. Two goes, two plus, two plus matches two minus. So a good answer would be, and I'm putting it at the top because I don't want to, I'm putting it right above four, as I can't get to the little line. So it would be Q, C, O, three. Same principle. Q, two plus, C, O, three, two minus, all right? Each of them goes with each other. Now one, two, one, we should just like that. And we have the formula, no charge. B, sodium reacts with chlorine to form sodium chloride a solid compound with a melting point of 801 degrees Celsius, which conducts electricity in solution or when molten. Deduce the type of bonding present in sodium chloride. Well, I don't know if we're going to deduce or we just know it because sodium is a metal, chlorine is a non-metal. Well, if we're, if we're approaching it that way, then we're deducing, but the bond is ionic state the appearance that sodium chloride is expected to have. It's supposed to be a white crystalline solid. C, carbon is a non-metal element that is in group four and exists in two forms, diamond and graphite. Um, the moment we see these, we should be thinking um, allotropes. Which of these forms of carbon conducts electricity? And of course, that would be graphite. Part two of 4C. Show by using diagrams the difference in structure between diamond and graphite, which accounts for their difference in conductivity. Use solid lines to show strong bonds and dotted lines to show weak bonds. So we just stated that graphite is the one that will conduct electricity. Let us look at why diamond will not conduct, but graphite will conduct, but we have to use diagrams. I'll just add a little annotation to drive home the point. So this is pretty much what is happening in diamond. We have one carbon bonded to four other carbon. And this is repeated throughout the entire structure. So we have to bear in mind that carbon is tetravalent. You're not putting this in your answer, but you're using it to guide you. So what the note we're going to make is that all the four valence electrons in each carbon atom are involved in covalent bonding. So we'll see it. All four electrons from carbon are involved 
in strong covalent bonds. So no, no, well, so no free electron is available to carry a current if a voltage were to be applied. All right, so we're just going to, we know that that represents strong bonds. That is enough, all right, that is enough. We're going to look at the structure of graphite now, another form of carbon. That's why we said allotropes earlier on. No, so this is what is happening. So in graphite, we find that each carbon atom is bonded to three others. Carbon is still tetra tetravalent and it should be taking part or it can take part in four bonds. So all, all the carbon atoms, they're taking part in three bonds instead of the four. So you might be asking then, sir, what about the, the fourth electron? And that's the question you should be asking because it means that the fourth electron is free and is spread out throughout the entire structure. Or you'll come across the term delocalized electrons. So it means if a voltage were to be applied, then, then these electrons would carry the current because electricity is really a move, movement of charged particles. These particles can be ions or electrons. So free electrons are present in the graphite. And so if a voltage were to be applied, it will carry the current. So that's why graphite conducts electricity. So let's finish um, the, the structure. So we have each carbon atom bonded to three others forming layers of hexagonal rings. Hope you're seeing the, the hexagonal um, shape, right? And if you, this, this layer can go on and on. I actually enjoy doing it. As I said, it's therapeutic. Don't just watch me do it, practice it. So, you know, it becomes muscle memory. Yeah, man. All right. So, of course, those are the strong bonds. And then what you find happening now, we have these weak, intermolecular forces that's holding the layers together. So they are, they are able to slide. They're able to slide over each other. That's why graphite or pencil point, as we know it, snaps so easily. All right, so we can state that these are weak, weak bonds and these are strong bonds. We can also state that each carbon atom has one, free electron to carry current. Just to drive home the point, and just like that, you would have gotten 15 marks. So this is uh, organic chemistry, reactions of organic compounds. And you know, it's all about the patterns. Organic chemistry is really nitty, therapeutic. It's a break from all those calculations, 6.02 times 10 to the 23 and so on and so forth. So it's meant for you to just relax and just flow through it. All right, part B. The fully displayed structure of compound C4, H10, that's a molecular formula. Now the fully displayed structure of this compound is shown in figure four, All right? This is compound B, and we should just carefully look at anything that jumps out at you. First thing that jumps out at you here is the fact that there's a carbon-carbon double bond, which is still in the UK. Alkene is telling me that it belongs to the family of um, organic compounds called the alkenes. All right, number one. And you know, before you read the question, there we go, we have answers already. It used the homologous series to which compound B belongs. So the carbon carbon double bond um, tells us that you know, it belongs to the alkene series. It is unsaturated. So we're going to say alkenes. And just like that, we're off to one mark. And they ask us to write the name of compound B. All right, so the name is going to be determined by the number of carbon atoms that are present and the functional group that's present, which is what gives it its last name. And also in this case, the position of the functional group. So we always count, we always count um, from the side where the, wherever the functional group is, will that carbon will get the smallest number. So this would be one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four. But um, we have four carbons and there's a prefix for when we have four carbons, all right? When we have four carbons, the prefix that we use is called but, B-U-T, not but, but. So we'll have but and then we'll have the ending part of the name. We said that the ending part 
is what tells us the family that it belongs to. So this would be beauty. beauty. All right, let's get the color right. So this would be beauty. Now, because that functional group could be in the middle here, we, um, we can just say this is normal beauty. I'm mean, going to put N, N beauty there. We could also call it beaut one in. All right, and we'll look at why we call it beaut one in based on um, the question that is coming up. All right, compound B exhibits structural isomerism. Part three, define the term structural isomerism. So it's the existence of it's the existence of organic compounds with the same molecular formula, but different arrangement of the atoms in space. Or we could say organic compounds having the same molecular formula, but different structural formula, because structural formula pretty much shows you how the atoms are connected to each other in space. All right, so we'll say. Right, and they want us to draw the fully displayed structure of any structural isomer of compound B and name it. So let us, let us just um, draw back what compound B is so we can have it as a um, reference. So we're given this compound B is what we have here on the side. And of course, we have to remember that all carbon atoms must be taking part in four bonds because carbon is tetravalent. Tetra means four, valent means it has four valence electrons that can take part in bonding. So all carbon atoms must be taking part in four bonds. Now we can have, there are two other isomers, two other structural isomers of um, this compound. Butene or N-butene, but one e There are two others. We could have one where we actually move the carbon-carbon double bond from the end to the middle, right? So we're going to draw one, we're going to draw what that would look like for one of the answers. We're going to just represent both of them and you can do it to go on your comfortable as long as you comfortable with, as long as you get the concept. So this would end up looking like if the carb if the carbon-carbon double bond were to be in the middle, then this is what the compound would look like. And they also ask us to name it. So we'll go right there. So this is, so the carbon carbon double bond is now in the middle. So we have to take care to ensure that each carbon atom is still participating in. Mm -hmm. There we go. Still have the same molecular formula, C4H8. And the name of this would be glute 2 in. Still four carbons, but the carbon carbon double bond is on carbon two. And whichever side we go from, it would be carbon number two. We're going from left to right. One, two, three, four. If we were to count from right to left, it would still be carbon, carbon two. One, two, three, four. So that's one of the structural isomers of butene. And then the other one, I'm going to split this box so we can uh, get the other one. To get the other one, what we would need to do, we would need to take this methyl group, the CH3 group that we have here from the original compound, and we would just replace it, trade places with the hydrogen that's on carbon two. So let's number one, two, three, four. So we'll take this methyl group at the end and we will replace it. We'll swap spaces with it and the hydrogen. And the idea here is to get a different arrangement of the compound. It's like playing with Legos. You're taking the Lego and your Legos and you're trying to make a new structure each time. 
uh, levels are good for you know the mental development of toddlers. So it's it's a similar process here. Can you imagine Legos helping you with organic chemistry, right? So if we were to do that, then this is what our compound would look like. So let's draw that compound that we're going to name it. So we'll have. Load our CH2 and then load our carbon carbon load our carbon carbon double bond but on this carbon carbon number two we would now put on the CH3 that we took from the end over this side. So we're taking our swapping space with the hydrogen and the CH3. So we put the CH3 right here. So we will we'll put our CH3 right here. And I'm not condensing it, so I'm writing it, join it out so we can all see that it's the same group that we're removing from the original stru um, structure. And if we replace you know, our original carbon, we'll have our hydrogen right here hydrogen right here. And then this hydrogen that we're moving, let's use um, green so we can see what's happening. The hydrogen here, we're going to put it now at the end. And that's a different arrangement. So we have the same molecular formula C4H8, but the atoms are arranged differently. So this would have a different name. So it is still three carbon long, three carbon atoms long. So the parent name would have to be something with probe in this case, because what we have now is carbon one, carbon two, carbon three. The longest chain has three carbons, so it's, it will have to be probe, right? And since it's an alkene, the family is still an alkene, so it will be propene, but other things are present, all right? We have, CH3 group on carbon two, right here. So we'll have to um, account for that. So the CH3 group is the methyl group and it's on carbon two. So we're going to give the position of that. So we'll say two methyl and the original name, as we said, the longest chain is three carbon. So we'll have to call this propene, pro. And it's from the alkene series, so it would have to be called propene. We say two methyl because we're, we're giving the location of the methyl. It's like giving your street address. You're saying two dumpling avenue or whatever it is. All right, so there's a methyl group on carbon two. So we say two methyl propene. Propene is the longest chain and it's still in the alke alkene series. Check. Part B, ethene and propene are typical monomers which are used as starting materials for making polymers. In forming polymers, ethene and propene undergo addition polymerization. Part one, define the term polymer, right? So a polymer is a macromolecule formed from the joining of 50 or more monomer units, right? Poly means many, mer coming from the word uh, monomer. So it's many mono monomer units joined together. So a polymer, so a polymer, let's just um, get this through. So a, po a polymer is a macromolecule formed from the joining of many monomer units, and we need at least 50 of those uh, monomer units. If part two, define what is meant by addition polymerization. So 
it's a macromolecule formed from join from the joining from from the joining of the same monomer units and these unit, monomer units are usually alkenes. State one use of each of the following polymers: polyvinyl chloride, aka PVC, used in the manufacturing. We can just say used to to make um, pipes or electrical conduits. And then um, another one here, Teflon. I'm sure we've heard this word before, right? Teflon. Uh, well, I've heard a popular DJ call this name Teflon. It's a cool name. This person is meant to be tough, but um, we'll see that it's not too tough of a, um, a name. Teflon is used as the nonstick material that um, coat, um, that they use to coat frying pan, frying pans and pots. So it's used as nonstick material that coats pots and pans. So. Teflon, Teflon isn't so tough after all. The Teflon is actually the brand name. It's really, so, so Teflon is the, the brand name, but it's actually called polytetrafluoroethylene. And it's made from many of these molecules that I'm drawing here, joined um, together. So not a tough name, not such a tough name after all. But anyway, let's, let's not get into that. Teflon. Probably a tough one would be Kevlar, the material they used to make um, bulletproof vests. But right, I guess it's about what sounds cool and catchy. Part C. There are several different types of polymers. Figure five and figure six below show the partial structure. We use the type of polymer shown and the type of polymerization reaction that took place in each case. All right, so we need to state the type of um, polymer shown here for this first um, structure. And the tip or you know, what I use when I am trying to identify the type of um, polymer, the first thing I do is I look, one, we need to look for the repeating unit. So this is our repeating unit. We need to find our monomer. And obvious, well, I won't say obviously, it appears that our monomer unit we can't say what the monomer unit is. Well, we can. The monomer unit in this case is, a, is an amino acid, all right? And we have several amino acids um, you know, joined together over and over. But what will really tell you the type of polymer is the type of bond that is there or the type of linkage. So the linkage here, let's um, circle it. That's our linkage. You see our linkage over and over, all right? Good, and then we see over this side, if we were to connect this end right here to what we have over here, we'll get back um, one of those linkages, but we're not going to um, stress that right now. This linkage that we see right here is uh, C double bond O N H. That's called the amide linkage. And whenever we see um, the amide linkage, then it means that the polymer is a polyamide. Right? Could also be called a polypeptide, seeing that amide linkage and the peptide linkage are the same thing. Those are names used to um, describe them. And then the type of polymerization is a condensation polymerization. So it's a condensation uh, polymerization. So whenever we see amide linkage or the ester linkage or the saccharide linkage, right? we saw like um, big words, but this is the, the ester linkage or the ester bond. Whenever we see that, or whenever we see the saccharide linkage, which is just a bond with O and a bond, whenever we see any of those three linkages, the amide linkage, the, the ester linkage or the saccharide linkage, it means we have a we have a condensation polymer here, or condensation polymerization actually took place. All right, figure six. Let's examine this um, partial structure. We are seeing a repeating pattern of CH2 
and then a CH with a CH3. That's a repeating pattern, all right? That's a repeating pattern. And then what's joining the repeating pattern, which is highlighted in blue, is a carbon-carbon single bond. So it, it's telling us here that we have a, we have um, an addition, poly, poly, well, we have an addition, or we have additional, we have addition polymerization taking place. So the type of polymer here would be a polyalkene. So this is formed from the joining of many alkene molecules. But when the joining has occurred, we don't end up with a carbon carbon double bond anymore. So let's take, for example, in this case, we would have had it use black. In this case, we would have had CH2 bonded to another C with H. And attached to that is a CH3. So let's, let's put two of them beside each other. Let's look. Let's look at how we would have arrived at this. So the, the monomer units would be CH2, carbon, carbon, double bond, CH, and here we have a CH3. Because we're, we're looking at the, the, the repeating pattern, the repeating units. So this would be, when we put this beside and we join this to a, another monomer unit, the same type. Those are those were the only um, repeating units we saw. So with a double bond again, CH, CH3. What we, what we do in the presence of you know, the right temperature catalyst, we pretty much cut one of these carbon-carbon double bonds. When we cut the carbon-carbon double bond, what we have happening, there will be um, a space on each carbon node for a bond. To be formed. So let's look at what would be uh, the intermediate um, molecules, what it would look like. So we'd have intermediate, we'd have C with the H, CH2. And because you, you, you just put um, the carbon carbon double bond up top, it means that space is available on this carbon for a bond. And then we still have one. One left joining the C to the H, which is also bonded to CH3. And we have a space on this um, carbon for a bond to form. The same thing happens in the other molecule, the other alkene molecule. So we'd have space free up right here, or space freed up right here. We have CH2. Then we'd have C bonded to the H, bonded to CH three and the space for a bond. So I'm going to use some squiggly lines in red to show the bonds and the little joint. So I normally call the bond a sticky end. So we have a sticky end right here. We have a sticky end right here. We have a sticky end right here as well. And over on this side, we have another sticky end. So in the middle, the sticky ends join. And what we end up with is a partial structure similar to what we have here. So if we remove, we we'll remove our original um, illustrations, we can show how we get this. So we could pretty much put on a sticky end right here, right? So this is what we have here. This is that sticky end, um, CH2. Here we are, CH2 we're reading. So there's a CH2 and then there is the remaining um, single bond from the, the double bond that was broken. Then we have carbon with the H and the CH3 right here. And then after that, we have a sticky end. So when these two, let's highlight this. When these two sticky ends join, or these two bonds join, it's like a kind of a knot. That's, where we, that's what we would get right here. So let me draw an arrow. Or just look at the, the parts in yellow. That's what we have. 
That's the bond right here. All right, and then we would have CH2, then CH with the CH3, and then we would have another sticky end, and they would tie it on. So that is what repeats over and over. And of course, as we mentioned earlier, the type of polymerization is addition. So the, look for the repeating unit and you look for the bond. In this case, you're looking for a carbon, carbon, single bond. All right? And that's that. With this, you would have gotten 50 marks. Six. Chlorine bleach can be used to prepare emergency drinking water supplies in time of natural disasters when pipe borne water is unavailable. It is made by mixing chlorine and sodium hydroxide, also known as caustic soda, in a kind of reversal of the chloralkyl process. State one physical property and one chemical property of chlorine. So physical property, we can say it's a yellow green gas. And there are other physical properties as well, like it's moderately soluble in water, it's denser than air. Let's just get right to the chemical property. All right, so chlorine reacts with metals to form metal chlorides. And just like that, two marks. Describe a simple laboratory test that can be used to determine the presence of chlorine gas. So we would use a moist blue litmus to test for chlorine gas. And if chlorine gas is present, it would turn the moist blue litmus paper to red, then it would bleach it. And two more marks. Part three, state two uses of chlorine gas other than for purifying drinking water. Don't want to get technical, but it's also used to disinfect pool. That's not drinking water, but that's one. Uh, we we'll also use it to make antiseptic, for example, Dettol. So let's just add that one. We also use it to make insecticides. All right, so DDT has chlorine in it. And we have mentioned that we use it to disinfect pools. So much more than two. All right, part B. CFCs are organic compounds used as refrigerants and propellants in spray cans for deodorants, paints, and insect repellents and are known to be harmful to the environment. Part one. State the meaning of the term CFCs. So CFCs mean chloro, fluoro, carbons, chloro, fluoro, carbons. Give a named example of a CFC and state its formula. All right, so we're just going to use the simplest one we can think of, CFC. So Chloro, fluoro, methane. So it's regular methane, CH4, but we have replaced two of the hydrogens with two halogens. So we've replaced um, one hydrogen with chlorine and the other with fluorine. So what we have is CH2ClF, part three. Give the name and formula of a molecule with which CFCs react in the environment. Now, straight up, ozone. We've been hearing about um, the hole in the ozone layer from I've been in primary school. And the formula is O3. Part four, so two marks just now. Part four. Part four, describe the process by which the use of CFCs result in a harmful effect on the environment. All right, so well, when we use um, chlorofluorocarbons, as they rise up to the upper atmosphere, the stratosphere to be more, are more exact, they, they are broken down when they come in contact with strong UV radiation. This releases chlorine radicals or the chlorine atoms. We haven't touched radicals as um, yet. And then the chlorine, 
chlorine atoms know or the chlorine radicals know react to the ozone. It eats away the ozone pretty much. And we have the ozone layer is there to protect us from the harmful UV rays. So with the ozone layer being um, depleted, you'll find that more harmful UV rays can come in. More of that will get to Earth. When it does, um, let's look at the effects on the um, environment. Phytoplanktons are at the base of the marine food chain, and these these are these can be damaged by the UV, the harmful UV radiation. Phytoplanktons they are they are UV sensitive. It also results in the disruption of leaf formation in plants, and we know that plants are at the base of the food chain for mankind, and that affects um, photosynthesis. Right, so we can have those are well, those are the environmental um, effects. Now it causes it causes um, more UV coming in. Also causes um, more more persons getting um, skin cancer, cataract, and so on. So those are the um, the environmental effects. We don't need to talk about the cataract and the skin cancer because you know that's not really an environmental effect, so to speak. So it's really what we just mentioned. So we're just going to write that down. All right, so CFCs are broken down in the upper atmosphere by strong UV radiation, which then results in the releasing of chlorine radicals or chlorine atoms, which further react with and deplete ozone. Without ozone layer to protect us from the harmful UV rays, more of it will reach the earth and can disrupt the growth of phytoplanktons, which form the base of the marine food chain. They can also reduce leaf formation in plants, which are also at the base of the human food chain. So those are the harmful effects on the environment. We don't have to mention the, the, the cancer or the cataracts because they ask for the um, effects on the environment. So we have to just be specific to that. So just like that, you would have gotten 15 marks. All right, so, and this would take us to the end of this, the end of this question. Um, thank you for joining. Please check out the others if you've missed them and leave a like, subscribe, turn on post notifications so you can see more. Couple later.